Chinese residents liken a quarantine site to a concentration camp in the city of Guangzhou. The facility was set up to combat a surge in the CCP virus there. While under at-home quarantine, a group of Chinese citizens were seen crying out to nearby authorities for help. They explained they'd been stuck inside for days without food. A Communist Party official murdered at the university he works for. A lecturer is the main suspect, and police say he was motivated by employment issues. For the first time ever, a Chinese scientist is going on trial in the U.S. That's for hiding his research work in China while taking government grants. And another herd of elephants are on the move in southwest China. The group comes after a separate band of 15 who caught the public eye with a more than 300-mile march. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. An online video from earlier this week appears to show large numbers of container rooms being transported into Guangzhou. That's China's newest epicenter of the CCP virus pandemic. The video was reportedly taken in Guangzhou's worst hit district. The netizens shooting the video suspected that they were for the purpose of constructing makeshift hospitals for virus patients. Local media also reported on Tuesday that more than 450 containers are scattered in a field located in the district. But local authorities denied the claim. They said the container rooms are going to be used as dormitories for thousands of health workers. The CCP is known for building many makeshift hospitals during the early stages of the pandemic in Wuhan. Three hospitals have the ability to quarantine large numbers of people under centralized control. And another video shows the condition of quarantine sites in Guangzhou. <laughs> So local residents describe these quarantine sites and their management style as being very similar to a prison or a concentration camp. It's less than a month away from the CCP's 100th anniversary on July 1st. And the party is planning mass celebrations. But Chinese officials seem to be troubled by the pandemic situation in Guangzhou. Authorities there are carrying out mass testing and have locked down various areas. The outbreak in Guangzhou is concerning because it involves a highly contagious virus variant first detected in India. As of now, Chinese authorities only officially reported about 100 cases in the city. Residents under lockdown in Guangzhou's worst hit district are reportedly starving. Strict lockdown measures are believed to be part of the reason. An online video from Wednesday shows CCP officials visiting the worst hit areas in Guangzhou City. And a group of residents were seen shouting for help at the officials downstairs. <laughs> Residents in places under strict lockdown also report that food prices have been artificially inflated. Guangzhou is China's third largest city and is home to nearly 14 million people. Some holes are starting to emerge in the natural origin theory of the pandemic. The theory says that bats infected other animals sold in Wuhan markets, and these animals spread the virus to humans. But a new research shows there were actually no bats sold in Wuhan. NTD's Don Ma has more. The natural origin theory of the pandemic is facing some challenges. A new research led by Oxford University shows that no bats were sold at wet markets in China's Wuhan leading up to the pandemic. According to the natural origin theory, bats carrying the virus infected live animals sold at the Wuhan's wet markets. These animals in turn infected humans. But how were the animals infected when there were no bats around? The research team surveyed all the different animals sold at Wuhan's markets between 2017 and 2019. They were doing research on subjects unrelated to the CCP virus. Each month, they would go to markets in Wuhan that sold live animals. They would ask vendors to list all the animals they sold that month. 
Over their study period, they saw nearly 50,000 animals being sold at these markets, but not a single bat. Their finding means that the main animal suspects in the natural origin theory were not present in Wuhan leading up to the pandemic in late 2019. The head of the research says that bats are actually rarely consumed in central China and that bat trading is not a significant issue in Wuhan. But it's still possible that the animals sold at these markets may have been infected before arriving there. The research found that some of the animals sold there were susceptible hosts for coronaviruses. This research comes amid renewed interests in the lab leak theory. Last month, President Biden ordered a 90-day investigation to further probe the origins of the virus. He said the lab leak theory is not being discounted. Don Ma, NTD News. A high-ranking communist official at a top Chinese college was stabbed to death by a teacher there. Police say it was over employment issues, but the suspect says he has been mistreated. Just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing due to its graphic nature. The highest-ranking Chinese Communist Party official at a top Chinese college was stabbed to death by his colleague, according to media reports. The suspect was a math teacher at Fudan University in Shanghai, surnamed Zheng. On Monday, he attacked Wang Yongzhen, the Communist Party secretary of the university's School of Mathematics. Chinese police claim that the killing was over employment concerns. A theory circulating online says that Zheng was dismissed from his teaching position for not meeting requirements outlined in a deal he signed with the school. But in an online video, Zheng said the school had been mistreating him for a long time. He also noted he carried out the attack alone. A Chinese netizen reacts to the case, saying, fortunately, this man did not kill innocent passers-by. This is likely because news of indiscriminate killings have been common in China in recent months. Just earlier this month, a man in eastern China killed six pedestrians on a shopping street with a knife. It was over his family issues. And a month before that, in May, a man in northeastern China drove his car into a crowd of pedestrians crossing a street and killed five. According to Chinese media, he felt hopeless after his investment failure. The Fudan case is still in progress. The Chinese regime passed a so-called anti-foreign sanctions law today. Observers say the move has more symbolic meanings than its actual application, and it's part of the regime's efforts to boost its image. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, passed the Anti-Foreign Sanctions Act during a meeting on Thursday. Under it, Beijing can ban foreign citizens from getting a Chinese visa and entering China. It can also freeze their assets in China. Chinese entities will be forbidden from doing business with those that Beijing sanctions. The act targets foreign individuals as well as their families and their entities. The Chinese Foreign Ministry says the act is to, as they call it, defend China's core interests and oppose Western hegemony and power politics. In recent years, countries including the U.S., the U.K., Canada and the European Union have imposed sanctions on various Chinese regime entities and CCP officials. They were over human rights abuses in Xinjiang and the national security law in Hong Kong, among other issues. And dozens of Chinese companies, including Huawei and ZTE, are also on the U.S.'s blacklist. The Chinese Commerce Department responded with a Chinese version of the blacklist both this year and last year. The Anti-Foreign Sanctions Act is regarded as a supplement. Senior commentator Johnny Lo tells Hong Kong media Apple Daily that the new act has more symbolic meaning than its actual use. That's because China doesn't have the power to proactively trigger a sanction war. He added that the move is meant to consolidate the CCP's image among Chinese people before its 100th anniversary in July. Coming up, for the first time, a Chinese scientist in the U.S. is going to be put on trial for hiding his research work in China. The scientist from the University of Tennessee got U.S. government grants for his work at the time. More on that after the break.
Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. A scientist from the University of Tennessee is facing charges for hiding research work in China while receiving U.S. government grants for his work in Tennessee. The case was brought to court on Monday, and he is the first to be put on trial, among many researchers arrested over similar accusations. An Ming Hu is a former assistant professor at University of Tennessee. He is facing felony charges including wire fraud and making false statements related to his work in China. The case stems from Hu's dual professorship with UT and the Beijing University of Technology in China. The prosecutor alleges that he hid his China collaborations from the U.S. government while receiving grants from NASA for his research at UT. Hu was born in China and is a naturalized citizen of Canada. He is the first professor at an American university to be criminally charged as a result of a 2011 law that keeps federal agencies from unwittingly funding the CCP's ambitions in scientific research. Who denies the charges? The U.S. Senate passed a $250 billion bill on Tuesday trying to boost competition with China in technology research. It also puts more restrictions on recipients of U.S. government research funds from accepting money from governments like China or Russia. As of now, the U.S. Justice Department has charged more than 10 scientists in the U.S. for hiding their financial ties to the Chinese regime or with the Chinese military. This move started in 2018 under the Trump administration. Huawei's tough times continue. American investment bank J.P. Morgan says it's going to exclude Huawei from some of its stocks indexes. This will reduce money Huawei can raise. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the details. J.P. Morgan says it will exclude Huawei dollar bonds from some of its most influential investment indexes. It follows increasing U.S. sanctions on Chinese tech firms. Last week, President Biden banned U.S. entities from buying or selling some Chinese company securities. The 59 Chinese companies allegedly have ties to the Chinese military. J.P. Morgan told its index users about the exclusion and said that proven glory capital and proven honor capital are explicitly named in Biden's order. Huawei was first blacklisted in 2019 over national security concerns. The ban has hit Huawei hard. They were once the biggest smartphone maker in the world, but now they are ranked six. First quarter results for this year show it has just a 4% market share. Huawei has repeatedly denied it is a risk. JP Morgan says it will exclude Huawei from the selected indexes starting July the 30th. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Canada's foreign minister doesn't seem to be worried that a firm owned by the Chinese police is currently running Canada's visa centers in Beijing. Concerns are rising that visa applicants' data could fall into the hands of the CCP. NTD's Don Ma has more. Canada hires a company called VFS Global to run its visa centers abroad. And in Beijing, VFS Global uses local firm Beijing Shuangxun as a subcontractor. Reports from February this year uncover that Beijing's police agency owns the local firm. But the Canadian foreign minister said on Monday that he is not worried about security concerns. IRCC officials closely monitor the activities of the visa application centers to ensure strict privacy standards as detailed in the contract, that we are not concerned about uh, VFS Global in Thank China. You. Many are raising the possibility that visa applicants' data could fall into the hands of the Chinese regime. Cybersecurity consultant and former advisor to the Canadian government, Robert Potter, told Canadian news outlet The Globe and Mail that Chinese authorities obviously have a huge interest in mining visa data. Under Chinese law, all companies must hand over data to the regime upon request. Beijing could also bar people from getting a visa if authorities don't want the person to leave the country. On many occasions, the CCP has condemned other countries for granting Chinese activists asylum. For some people, it could even be dangerous if the regime knows that they're applying for a visa. The Globe and Mail says Muslims in China could be flagged as terrorists for simply applying. Don Ma, NTD News. 
Australia's Prime Minister is rallying G7 leaders to unify against China's economic coercion. He wants the World Trade Organization to punish bad behavior when it happens. NDD's Patrick Hayden speaks to one trade expert to get his view. Trade tensions are high between Australia and China. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison wants to see the World Trade Organization address economic coercion. He called out the issue Wednesday in Australia before heading to England for a G7 meeting. At the G7, we will be working with others to buttress the role of the World Trade Organization and to modernise its rulebook where necessary. A well-functioning WTO that sets clear rules arbitrates disputes objectively and efficiently penalises bad behaviour when it occurs. Morrison is calling to revive the WTO's independent court to resolve trade disputes. We spoke to one trade lawyer who says that would take years. He says he thinks Morrison has been misinformed. In, in, in the normal American English, ain't going to happen anytime soon. So, but the, the call for unity is absolutely the, the, the perfect. Australia's blocking of Huawei in the country and its calls for an independent investigation into the origins of the CCP virus has infuriated China. China's retaliatory tariffs have disrupted trade in Australian grain, seafood, wood, beef, wine and coal. Kalara says the G7 meeting is a good place to build ties with other leaders. The United States backed Australia on the matter last month. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to state that you will see action out of the G7, strong action. But politically, if you start to contact with domestic actors in all these countries, you can build pressure on the national leaders, and that's how you get things moving. He says if they change China's trading status, then the regime will be willing to listen. Sure. Uh, I, would just, I would just say that uh, the, the big stick of removing most favored nation treatment from Chinese imports needs to be waived, needs to be you know, shown. And we need to, the West needs to start taking action in that direction. If that happens, then you will see the Chinese Com Communist Party respond. He says using economic isolation against Australia won't work in the long term. He says if China keeps sanctioning people, it will alienate countries it wants to do business with in the long term. Prime Minister Morrison says the G7 meeting can give direction to a WTO conference on trade reform in November. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Japan and Australia are set to increase their security and trade ties to new levels. This amid rising tensions between China and other countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including the two countries. Japan's foreign minister said on Wednesday he hopes to increase security and trade ties to new levels with Australia. The two countries' foreign and defense ministers were having a meeting. The Japanese defense minister explained what challenges they face in the region, hinting at communist China's expanding influence. Attempts to unilaterally change the status quo by force in the East China Sea and South China Sea have become more serious. There are also moves to take advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to create an order that is favorable to themselves and expand their influence. In such a situation, in order to ensure peace and stability in the region, unity among like-minded countries that share fundamental values and strategic interests is required more than ever. The Australian foreign minister also talked about the friendly ties between the two countries. She said that she talked to some athletes who were excited to join the Tokyo Olympics in July. India's industrial tycoons have ousted Chinese tycoons among the richest people in Asia. Chinese tech tycoon like Jack Ma for years dominated Asia's wealth rankings. Bloomberg data shows that two Indian billionaires have now topped some of China's richest in net worth. The chair of conglomerate Reliance Industries, with an estimated net worth of $84 billion, and the infrastructure tycoon with $78 billion. Stock rallies in India boosted their fortunes. India's Nifty 50 index, which trades the country's 50 biggest companies, has jumped 10 percent from its April lows. Chinese founder of the bottled water business, Nangfu Spring, was third on the list, with Tencent founder Pony Ma and Alibaba founder Jack Ma trailing behind in fourth and fifth place. Another herd of elephants was spotted in southwest China. This group of 10 Asian elephants is separate from the 15 that attracted attention for traveling over 300 miles. 
This herd was seen in a bamboo forest in Yunnan province, the hub of Asian elephant communities. It is unclear why the elephant herds are on the move. Local media said there is less food available in the elephant's habitat. And the habitat itself is shrinking, as banana, tree or rubber plantations replace tropical forest. In addition, some forest area is used to grow ingredients for traditional Chinese medicine. The elephant population in Yunnan has grown in recent decades, but the Asian elephant species is still considered endangered. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, we have a new special report coming up this Friday. In it, we lift the veil on the mysteries surrounding China's organ transplant industry and look into what's happening behind the curtain. For years, China's organ transplant industry has been matching patients with organs at speeds unimaginable in the West. In some cases, finding four hearts in 10 days or two livers in just 24 hours. So how are they able to have this quote-unquote on-demand transplant system that's a, capable of extremely short times? The only way they can be doing this is if they have another source of living donors that are available on demand. They become anonymous uh, prisoners of conscience and that makes them extremely vulnerable because they can disappear at any time without a trace. This isn't just a totally China contained crime. There's complicity in what China is doing throughout the world. Our medical community could become accomplices to this horrible, terrific tragedy. Be sure to check out the special report on Epoch TV. China in Focus is partnering with the platform, and that's where you can watch our exclusive content every Friday night. In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website, and the Epoch TV website. Thanks for watching and see you soon.